morning. Welcome to the sixth episode in our Rethinking Religion series. We were planning to meet uh, about a month ago, and as it happened, that was going to be one day after my very first psychedelic journey in my life. Um, so I was thinking possibly of sharing my experience because I was still in that state and able to reflect on, on kind of the effects of that. And I'm not going to do that now. It's, it's, it's a lot of that's faded, but there's one piece out of that journey that I wanted to offer in the very beginning here as a way in to our conversation, because it was in some ways resonant with things we've discussed before and, and also what I want to bring up. So during the journey, there was a period when I became very clearly aware of the flow of verbal thought, and I could see it arising and moving. And I felt that there was this underside to sections of the verbal speech. It wasn't all the way along, but there were juncture points and areas where it felt like there was a dark string of unpronounceable consonants on the back side of what was being articulated. And something about that felt to me very embodied and contactful. And it was a different way of knowing. It was a, I called it dark consonantal, where it was a body to body assurance of being. Uh, there was a connection, there was a participation, like maybe the, the, the infant on the mother's body receiving the assurance of being and the, the inchoate, inarticulate muttering that is just a, a participation in an inarticulate field. And so I felt that that was underlying aspects of speech. And I played in my mind at that time between the word dark consonants and dark consonants, where the consonants means a kind of resonance or harmony. And that it just felt to me that underlying articulate speech was this other mode of knowing. And I know that we've touched on that in some ways. At the very end of our conversation last time, I had mentioned that it didn't sound like we had a super clear idea where we were going next, but we had a general idea, but I liked the open-endedness. And we had just been talking about the virtue of finesse. And so Lehman joked that we were finessing being at the edge of whatever our own dialogos had produced. And we were just going to try to stay there. And to me, that that that's that dark underside that we're, we're, we're finessing, maintaining contact with with whatever is uh, uh, still implicate, still un not yet unfolded, right? And we also talked about, at the very beginning of our conversation, uh, Thulu as a patron deity and the, the importance of being in contact with that which can shatter meaning and that which is unnameable as inculcating uh, the virtue of epistemic humility and the lightness of touch. Uh, which again relates to finesse, in my opinion. So that's what I wanted to say is just a prologue. And, and there's a piece I want to offer now as a, as a way into the conversation. And it's from, again, from David Bohm's work. I had mentioned David mm -hmm. Bohm's suspension as a possible virtue. And we were talking about that and finesse and also this triad of, of virtue and virtuosity and virtual engineering. So this other piece I want to offer right now is more in the virtual engineering territory. Mm -hmm. And that's his project of the RIA mode. And the RIA mode is a verbal experiment that he got up to. Uh, he wanted to develop a more process-oriented verbal flowing form of language, real flow, flowing form of language. Layman knows from... I've talked to him too many times, I think, in my past, maybe at the tender age of 20, I was inspired by Bohm to create a process and perspective-based language that didn't make use of nouns at all. And I spent a year developing an entire new language that was rooted in a different kind of grammar and perception. And that's not exactly what Bohm was doing, though. And I, I kind of misread him in my 20s. <laughs> I went too far with it. But what he was doing, he was not trying to create an alternate language. And he was not trying to perfect language as some old philosophers had done. Instead, he wanted to use verbal uh, experimentation, grammatical experimentation, as a way to 
gain insight into cognitive process, especially the participatory and inactive nature of, of, of cognition and perception. And he felt that there were tweaks that we could do to language that would help us to see that better and also perhaps participate in meaning making in a deeper way. So I don't know how familiar you are with the RIA mode, but for the, the sake of our listeners, I'll just say briefly what he got up to with that. And the idea really was, again, uh, to, to experiment with language forms to, to see what that could yield in terms of insight. And this seed began even 20 years before he developed the RIA mode. He was talking to another person about it that he was having some insight, especially from the uh, theory of, uh, of groups in mathematics about the way that the holes and, and subholes are, are related, the way the groups that are related to each other, a group operating on itself will reproduce itself and it may contain subholes that reproduce themselves, but there's a kind of holographic mirroring or projecting um, among the, the different elements. And he had the insight back then that of the deeper orders of being, that can be projected and in fact is projected at some level into the types of ordering and, and, and function and flow and process of cognition and, and, and speech. And that there was a, a homology uh, among them and that we could use language to illuminate that and to attune to that in some ways. And so one of the things that he did uh, to start this project, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up in a conversation with John, was that he started with the word relevance as the most fundamental pivot point around which he wanted to build everything. And for him, re relevance was a fundamental uh, part of cognition. And so he took the, the root of that levate, relevant is from levate and so he said levate means he, he said let's propose that levate means the unrestrict, unrestricted act of lifting any content whatsoever into attention yeah. and so that that lifting up into attention is is unrestricted in the sense that it's not limited to the intentionality that's behind it but that it's that it actually can be unfolded in many ways including attention to the act of lifting itself. So there's a recursivity that's built into it. And so then he would say, relevate, relevate is to lift up into attention again, especially through thought and, and, and speech. That act of lifting up into attention again, relevate, and if it fits the context in which it is lifted, then you will say, it's relevant. To relevate is relevant. But if it doesn't fit the context in, into which it's lifted, then you would say to relevate is irrelevant, irrelevant, right? And so then he would unpack that further into things like irrelevation is this ongoing act of lifting something up into attention that doesn't fit the context. And so it's a failure of attention at that point. And attention when it's marshaled uh, in the proper way, can end irrelevation, right? And it'll, it'll, and then you can realign with, you know, again, more proper acts of calling attention to something. And so that was a kind of frame that he built with, with uh, relevance. But then he extended it to four other or three other uh, very closely related cognitive operations. One was just for perception itself, which he said vidate. So to vidate is basically to perceive anything at all. And revidate is to, again, uh, return your attention to something, especially as prompted by thought. And then uh, he did the same thing where you, you can see what's, what you can see whether uh, what is seen matches what is, whether it's illusion or not. So you could say, you know, to revidate is revident or to revidate is irrevident. So you could again see the um, there's the fitting, the 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 master uh, theme of relevance plays through all of these in a sense. There's a, the a picking up on on fitting there, um, and then he did it for um, 
division where he would say vidate, then you can dividate, which means not to divide, but to see as separate, right? right? To see as two, to see as separate. And so there are cases where seeing as separate is appropriate and cases where seeing as separate is not appropriate. So there is uh, redivident and irredividence, right? Where it's it, it's appropriate to see that and not appropriate to see that. And there are ways to go on perceiving division where it's not appropriate. And, and that is what he calls fragmentation and is part of the root of what he sees as in your language, John, a meaning crisis for our times. He didn't have that language, but he was seeing fundamental cognitive fragmentation and loss of meaning throughout society as something he wanted to address with his dialogue and with his language experiments. And then ordination is another word that he used where it, uh, he followed the same patterns of how to perceive order and see if the order matches what it's held up against. And so the same structure and he fought, and there are many other words he used, uh, you know, factate um, for making. He wanted to say that a fact is not a given property of an object, but it's something that's made. And there's the act of constatation, which is to basically go on reconstituting something as a persistent being. So in any event, he, he, he laid out all kinds of uh, ways of playing verbally with perception and mining into the different structures of perception as a means of attuning and aligning ourselves to those deeper movements and bringing a kind of transparency to the function of thinking. Because as he would point out, the very, the very word in the saying is actually pointing to the action that's taking place in the saying of it. So yes. there's this immediate recursive contact with itself that proper attention to these modes can bring you into. And this for him is part of the overall practice of dialogue and something called riosoma, which I might talk about later, where it's the whole bringing the whole body into flow with the larger context. And so that's what I wanted to bring up is this act of speech as a religious act and as a cognitive scientific act. Um, and, and, and that that some of our inquiry has been turning on some of these things. And so I, I wanted to offer that into our circle. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, a lot that's really sparking with me. Um, first, the question. Bruce, where is Bohm doing all that work, especially around relevance and making things salient and all? Like, where, what work is he doing that in? Is there a book or is there a series of articles or? The main place or the, the first place that he introduced it and really unpacked it is the book Wholeness and the Implicate Order. Right. Um, and then he does take it up again in uh, some of his books like Unfolding Meaning. Okay. I think I have Unfolding Meaning. And I also have his book on dialogue. I guess I'll have to get wholeness in the implicate order. Uh, um, all right. Well, first of all, that's amazing. I didn't know that. He obviously didn't know me. Um, so that's tremendous convergence yeah. Um, yeah. on many points, which ends, lends plausibility to my work or his work and my work. So first of all, just thank you for doing that. Um, that's impressive. I want to then go through respond in sequence. Um, I think that experience you had of the consonants and consonants, the underside of language, um, that's to remind us that language is, is actually dual aspect. There is its reference existent, what it points to, but it, there's all, also, you know, it, its vehicle uh, existence, you know, like the word dog. It's about dogs, but it's actually this little graphic thing, and it can be made of black ink or blue ink, and it can take up this much space or this much space, etc. And of course, uh, children take a while before they learn that duality and be, are able to manage it. Uh, so it's a developmental achievement that we take for granted. But there's a lot of good experiments to show that children struggle with that, uh, with good reason. Uh, and then what happens is, and this is what the Stroop effect shows, is the the, the vehicle tends to be become 
uh, like transparent to us. We don't see it. We see through it. So the Stroop effect is you give people a bunch of color words like red, green, blue, but the word red is in green ink and the people have to say the color of the ink rather and they'll and they'll go green right it's one of, it's the most studied effect in all of psychology by the way there's probably over a thousand studies now my favorite is the effect of lunch on the stoop effect apparently if you have lunch you're a little bit less prone to the stoop effect hmm. so <laughs> anyways the point i'm making is there's a kind of sati remembering of reminding that language does not only represent, it instantiates, right? It instantiates, and it instantiates properties, fundamental properties of here-ness, now-ness, togetherness, flowing through time, right? Of all kinds of things that participate in fundamental structures of intelligibility for reality. And I think that psychedelic experience i'm proposing to you that's a re it's an insightful remembering that language does not merely represent it participates mm -hmm. in a deep way in reality and we have lost that and of course we are losing it more and more the more we get sort of print based and speed up the pace of things etc so i first want to propose that and then uh the next thing you say, and I, I, I think the first thing links to the next thing, which, I mean, sounds like Bohm discovered Neoplatonism. Um, oh, wait, <laughs> there, there's levels of intelligibility that are isomorphic and participate in levels of reality, and tracing those out is important and effective. And yeah, and the fact that people are often independently, again, coming to this uh, lends plausibility to we should be taking Neoplatonism seriously again. Um, and so I think the first point leads to the second point. And then I think the connection you made between the second point and the third point is one I've been trying to forge right now. And that's, well, logos, the gathering together, so things belong together, the speech, the ordering of thoughts and logic, uh, right, all of this is actually exemplifying relevance realization, that that's the best interpretation of logos. Um, we can find relevance between, like we can find relevance as implication between propositions in our inferences, and that's logic, but we can also find relevance between features and a gestalt in our perception. And of course, speech does not, speak about relevance it exemplifies it it exemplifies relevance realization it participates in logos and then the fundament and the idea and i'm not going to review all the arguments i've made about how relevance realization is deeper than logic it's deeper than computation it's deeper than representation and it actually instantiates fundamental properties like analogous principles to the principle of evolution and the principles by which potentiality is actualized in reality uh, or because if it doesn't then we're sort of locked into uh, persistent uh, and inescapable skepticism and sol solipsism and so the neoplatonism carries over into uh the relevance realization and 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 that's logos and then dia logos is trying to sati to remember and remind, not just recall, but bring it into constraining, in both senses of the word, before it, constraining, affording your cognition. It's to remember the priority and primordiality of logos in our conversations and try and make our conversations uh, reflectively aware so they further presence the exemplification of logos. Because the proposal that, you know, that Chris Master Pietro and Guy Senstock and I are doing, and also the work I'm doing with Johannes Niederhauser and Daniel Zaruba, is that form of conversation, dialogos, actually comports us to do that Neoplatonic act of finding 
those resonant isomorphisms and not just talking about them, but enacting them and tracing them out in the ascent in the anagoge. And that affords us to actually do eidetic deduction to find the through line. And we talked about that and I won't go through that. And, and that's important because it reorients us. I'm reading Stegmeier's really excellent book on orientation, really consonant with relevance realization theory that reorients us. Um, so we are in ratio religio, uh, uh, well-proportioned, appropriate connectedness to reality. And so for me, everything you said just was just stringing all that together. And I take dialectic, which we can do, into dialogos, which we can't do, we can only participate in. Um, I take that to be a religious ritual in the deep senses of the word. It's a ritual and there's a kind of knowing which gets us to the underside, the non-propositional aspects of speech, the perspectival and the participatory in a transformative way. So we get a ratio of our religio, of how we are connected. And I think that ritual of uh, reappropriative realignment is a fundamental one uh, for any religious life. And I think we have to significantly degree lost it, at least in practice, maybe not in theory, but in practice in a lot of the legacy religions. And one of the things I'm trying to do uh, that now brings us back to what this series is about is to uh, reintroduce this uh, into uh, groups as a meta practice for any ecology of practice um, such that they can uh, access and activate the collective intelligence of distributed cognition, which will help them create and curate and coordinate individual and collective ecologies of practices. And I think this is central to revisioning uh, religion for our times. So that was a long thing I said, but I want to, I, everything you said was, <laughs> was relevant to me in a, in a significant way. And so I want, that's my response. And, and, and then it leads to the proposal I just made. It's, uh, <laughs> there's so much in what each person is saying here. I think we'll, we'll each get to speak once and then we'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I resonate with all this stuff. And where my mind goes is to a couple of religious functions, I might call them. Uh, it seems to me that virtually every religion I know of has some variant of the, of the tale of how primal telling works, right? The, the most famous one is in the beginning was the word. But if, if someone was even going to parody religion, they would start with telling you the opening Star Wars scroll, like here's how reality starts. But they're really trying to tell you the story of here's how the storying of reality starts. Here's how language operates in its potential to simultaneously fit reality and transparently reveal its own function. So I like the way Bohm is doing that. Right? That's a contemporary version of trying to do that same thing that I think the great uh, religious languagers were trying to do throughout history, even in very primal settings. And I think we should be looking for phrasings that seem valid in a contemporary sense that people might need to have as their primal cosmology, something that tells them the pattern by which cognition attempts to map a universe. And that also allows us the opportunity to look for people who are religious workers in the sense of some people want a really good tale, and other people are really interested in the skill of being able to generate new versions of these tales. And that's a sort of special cast of people we might need for re the religious gardening of the species, let's say. I also thought about uh, invocation practices as, yeah. as doing a great job of revealing this dual function of language that John was yes. pointing to. Yes, uh, Particularly, I mean, we see it with eroticism, but we also see it in, um, you know, if I start to speak about the most high and the most merciful and the most perfect one, I'm not just pointing to something. I'm shifting a mode in the listener as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm showing that form of the magic incantation that uh, most of our ancestors pointed to as the fundamental religious function. 
Well, I think all of that um, brings some of these ideas back to very ancient notions of what religious practitioners are doing. But there was another thing that stood out to me from Bruce's tale about the, uh, the proto onomatopoetic dark continent of dark consonants <laughs> hidden, <laughs> hidden on the flip side of reality and perceived through the gaps in the language. And I think one of the functions of religion is to um, stand in for and point us toward additional ranges of affect, right? Especially in the contemporary world, we suffer an impoverished affect length, at landscape, let's say, yeah. right? That our, our noises and our images are made very simply for humans to be able to quickly grasp, uh, unlike the rich complexity and nuance of the ecological environment. Yeah. So we may have lost some capacity but even when we had that capacity there's still ranges of things outside of the you know electromagnetic frequency and the tempo that our brain can track and so Cthulhu or the you know, dark Aztec gods or even the unfathomability of Jehovah in some ways that figure represents a whole range of possible affects that you aren't able to get and are there ways to get to some of those aspects and therefore get a richer map of reality? And the psychedelic journey is one of those, right? Training and perception is one of those things. But there's another thing that came up in the way you were describing Bone Bruce that reminded me of John's uh, oppositional use of framing. So your, your, sorry, your cognition is looking for a whole bunch of possibilities, then trying to lock it down, going back and forth between these yes. things. Yes. And there's, there's a mode of trying to hold space in the middle. You know, Salvador Dali, who in his writings was clearly a, a mystic practitioner, even though people don't read his writings very much. He worked with this thing called the paranoiac critical faculty, which yeah. is very much like kids looking at clouds. But you don't just see a cloud shape and go, oh, it's a dog. Because in that moment, you also go, it's a dog, but it looks like it has a second ear you know, on its back and, and maybe too many legs. And so you, you've opened and you've fit, but you didn't let the fit collapse just to the concept you already knew. You allowed it to expand into a mid-range. And in that mid-range, you glimpsed a whole set of other qualities that you might not normally have found. And we do this wow. in kids' books because it's an important part of psychoneurological training. But we might be able to uh, return to some of that, or it may be one of the functions of religious systems to help people find their way experientially into expanded ranges of affect, and that might involve a certain use of the oppositional machinery. That, wow, uh, yeah, yeah, which is an evolutionary function, because you're opening up. Is that what he means by paranoid critical, by the way? The paranoid is sort of the opening up. Paranoid and the critical faculty is what he tries to capture in these paintings where you look at something and you see that it's also something else at the same time yeah. without right, ceasing right. to be the first thing. So they kind of modify each other's meaning. That's cool. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, that. Well, I got to look that up now, too. Uh, so that, that that's fascinating. And I'm just resonating about the idea of surreality, surrealism there, about opening up uh, us to realism beyond uh, sort of consensus frame realism. Yeah, that, wow, there's just a lot banging around in my head. So one of the things you're suggesting, Lehman, is, right, there might be specific dimensions of religious practice that are appropriating, and hear the word appropriate within appropriation too, are appropriating this attentional opponent processing in order to open us up to deeper dimensions of realization. Do I understand you correctly? Absolutely. And I think the, you know, probably the longest period of religious history involved people doing that with the stars in the night sky, which seemed yeah. to be foundational for a lot of the structure of early religion. Well, and Matt Rossano actually argues perhaps even earlier around fire. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have a shared focus of this thing that you can see forever, so many things in it and has a life of its own and seems to be <coughs> warm the way we are and has ability to generate light the way this uh, you can. And he says we might have meditating on fire might have been natural to us uh, because creatures that are fascinated by fire can overcome the fear of fire. And so we'd be selected for that. And then that drove an expansion and flexibility of working memory. 
And of course, Zoroastrianism has fire right at the core. Um, and so I, I think, and I, I tried to argue that in, uh, I think, one episode of Waking from the Meaning Crisis, that I think there's a, a, a loop. I think we evolved the capacity for this ref reflexive, not necessarily fully reflecting, but we have this metacognitive ability to monitor and manage the dynamics of our attention in a way that made us more human, but then also made us more intrinsically interested in that, uh, that in that manipulation of attention that enhances, that creates ratio religio, and then you get that loop going. And that's <clears throat> where religion, one function of religion uh, lives. Um, and I think, I think that's right. And I do think, I mean, it's clearly the case in Buddhism, right? <laughs> like that's Buddhism is all like, that's its core thing. Uh, well, one of its core things, ethical practice is another one of its core things, and good reflective aspiration is also, but it's one of the three main parts of the Eightfold Path. Taoism has it in it tremendously about, uh, and then we're realizing, of course, uh, that Christianity, insofar as it uh, makes use of the Neoplatonic tradition, also has it in it, um, and then therefore sort of Sufism and Kabbalah, right? And 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 so I think I think there's just a lot of converging evidence that, and I think it's also in shamanism. I argued that in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So, you know, I, I think it's just primordial and profound. And it, it, it struck me so powerfully when I learned about this, you know, because of how little of this I was exposed to in my Christian upbringing. It was all about assent, assent, like a, like agreeing, affirming, committing yourself to the truth of propositions. It was a little bit of singing, right, and and I guess a little bit of attention when we did communion, but it wasn't even considered the Eucharist. It was just you no, know, it's just a symbol. This, this it's always struck me odd about that that aspect of Protestantism. It's it's. it's the, the Eucharist is just a symbol of Jesus's body and blood, which are just a symbol of, yeah, but you don't care about symbolism. You're, <laughs> you really don't seem to care about it. It's not important in your ontology. So, mm -hmm. I, so uh, I, I've come to realize that that um, is not all of Protestantism. It's certainly not all of Christianity. Um, and so I'm only speaking to the particular background I grew up in. But I do think there is, I'm not bringing that up just for autobiographical uh, masturbation. I'm bringing it up because, right, I, I'm trying to say that there's a reason why that Protestantism existed and emerged and emerged and is powerful. And that's because, again, of the propositional tyranny in the culture as a whole. And so I think, again, return, now to return it back to you, Bruce, one of, one of the things that psychedelic experience did and why it might have had a significance, an affective significance uh, in both meanings of the words, and also to pick up on what said, is because of that sati of, uh, uh, of the non-propositional, but also the release from the tyranny of the propositional. I think that's a very, very significant thing. And so there's two things that reliably reduce the Stroop effect, which is how we have internalized into the guts of our cognition, the tyranny of the propositional, right? One is hypnotism. That's how Amir Raz was actually to, able to prove that hypnotism is a real thing. He hypnotized people and said, and told them, don't read the word, just say the color. And they had a huge reduction, a measurable reduction in the Stroop effect. And, and you can't you can't placebo the Stroop effect. I can pay you, I'll, I'll pay you $500 if you get faster and, and not, and you, it doesn't matter, you're still, Paul Prey of the Stupa. The other thing, Moore and Malinowski, is mindfulness practice. Mindfulness practice also reduces the Stupa. So there's something about that attentional realization that releases us from the tyranny of the propositional that has, I think, two religious dimensions to it. One is the sati of the non propositional, but the other is the liberation from the tyranny of. The propositional. I love that. Yeah, I'm going to try to finesse 
a connection between a couple elements here <laughs> um, that were not immediately related, but I think are relating to what you're sharing here. And I, th that tyranny of the propositional really rings home. And, and I don't know what you would say about this, either one of you, in terms of this proposition, but uh, of interoception, you know, there's been a study that really interoception is really dropping in the population. A lot less people have access mm -hmm. to interoception. And I would just intuit that this is related to the tyranny of the propositional and, and overall to the meaning crisis. And so in our last conversation, uh, Lehman had mentioned that maybe we should get into something a little bit about time. And I'm also was just talking a moment ago about Bohm's uh, holoflux and, and, and Riosoma work. So I'm going to try to finesse that connection really quick. Uh, in terms of time, I think one thing that we've been talking about here are, are different types of awareness. And, you know, of course, there's the familiar single loop awareness and um, double loop awareness and triple loop awareness, right? Where the single loop awareness is just basically following on act to act just procedurally, right? Double loop awareness is where you become aware of a schema underneath your act and you, you see, I need to maybe change that schema. And so there's an adjustment of the schema in the acting. Uh, but then triple loop awareness is where you, you move to a non-conceptual perception where you're able to perceive the interaction of schema and activity. And there's a degree of liberation from the tyranny of being locked into the verbal schema and the acts. And, and there's a opened up possibility, I think, for accessing different affects, different insights, different modes of participation in the situation. And we can look at time related to that too. This is from Bill Torbert, but he, he talks about uh, zero dimensional time, which is basically just immersion in the flow of things without any awareness of time, pretty much. One dimensional time is you're aware of the sequential unfolding of things, and that's pretty much related to single loop awareness. Um, then there is second dimensional time, which is where you become aware of the nook stands, you know, the, the standing now, and you can see this background now in relationship to the unfolding activity. And then triple loop awareness is what Lehman was talking about, I mean, a third dimensional time in relationship to triple loop awareness is where you're living in that place of the between that is a present that's also poised between past and future. And it's a very participatory mode of being that sees your own posture in the world as participating in the unfolding of orders and meanings. And there's a, a very deep sense of participating in time, what the time-space knowledge vision would call nuclear time where the there's a it's not just the standing now but there's this active participation in in the multidimensionality the full volumetric <laughs> dimensions of time so one of the practices that uh lee nickel following from david bohm is talking about at the very end of his life actually 10 days before he passed away david bohm was in a conversation with lee nickel and David Bohm was expressing frustration, saying, the dialogue is beautiful, it's working, but it, there's something wrong. And there's something missing. People need to be doing some forms of practice outside the dialogue to ready yes. their, themselves, to ready their body for what they're doing in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so they talked briefly about it, but then he passed away a few days later. Um, so... Lee Nickel carried on with that and said one of the things that he really tuned into was this notion of Bohm's hollow flux, which is his notion of the flowing reality, the, the deep, inter, intimately related flowing re reality. And so he has a, pra a set of practices, the Rio Soma, where you first contact the moving body and develop interoception again, you know, or, 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 or increase our interoception and really begin to feel the flowing body. The, um, the holoflux practices where you align the body with the deeper flows of the world around you. And you can do that by attending to fire. You can do that by attending to the movement of clouds or the subtle motion of trees or, or mountains. And there's this practice of participating between flows in the body, outside the body, 
And to me, that's so resonant when I was in, in the Krishnamurti schools and really doing a lot of work of following the flow of, of thinking in my mind, I would take these long walks along the Ganges yeah. River and, and watch the movement of thought. And spontaneously, I began to feel that my body aligned in its movements with the very flowing yeah. nature of the forest. I felt this attunement happening. And so that's a kind of practice that they're doing is this attuning of the, the, the flows of the body with the larger flows, and then taking it to the micro level to really look at how meaning and, and, and is unfolding in different ways, s such as through you know the, the RIA mode and that, that attention to the different ways that uh, relevance and, and other things are picked up and un unpacked. And so there's this practice of doing that, which to me, that moving between these different these different dimensions of, of flow is that practice of putting between. It's a participatory practice that puts you into that third order time. So that's just my suggestion there. That's, uh, well, I mean, when uh, when Guy and Chris and I do the circling into the into, uh, dialectic into Dialogos, we first give them a meditative practice where they're centering and then, right, and they're picking up on their interceptive uh, sensations. Interception, by the way, is predictive of your ability to pick up on other people's uh, uh, mental states. Interception going down is bad because interceptive reduction is a predictor of psychopathy, of people being psychopaths. Um, and of course, all, all along the continuum of being incredibly self-referential like narcissism. Uh, so uh, part of the general meaning crisis uh, tsunami. But then I take them through a contemplative practice, a Neoplatonic contemplative practice, making use of Neoplatonism and, and John Rusin's work and get them to pick up on the rhythm of process uh, and then the melody of patterning within and without and its musicality because music is within and, and then uh, and then the harmony of principle, uh, getting exactly that attunement. And then we do the circling practices where they attune with each other and circling relies on interception as much as interception. And then we do uh, 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 a, a, a philosophical contemplation where they learn to do that with each other and with a text. And then we do a paraphrasing practice. So you get really good at listening and attuning. And then, and then we take them into the dialectic, into dialogos practice. So totally, uh, totally. And we're, tr and we're, trying, to, we're trying to add other things. Uh, we're going to do a second tier in which we put in some projection and shadow work. And then we're also going to do uh, a variation on, we're going to create a variation on Socratic dialogue. So whereas dialectic into dialogos tends to be very apophatic, Socratic dialogue um, tends to be cataphatic, and then you're trying to get the hyperphatic between them. So I think, I think it, it, yeah, it, it, it goes both ways. You need to have this whole running ecology of practices that generates a pedagogical platform into dialectic into dialogos. But then dialectic to dialogos needs to be curating, right, the ecology of practices. That's actually how I would build on uh, Bohm's proposal. And I've got to now read Lee Nichols. Boy, Bruce, you just give me a ton of stuff I have to read. <laughs> and I'm, do I'm reading so much right now already. But yeah, I, I mean, again, converged on that independently. I'm not aware of Nichols' work. But yeah, uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think, again, I'm very critical of the way we have reduced mindfulness to meditation. And for all of the good work that Kabat-Zinn did, his definition of meditation does not really tap into the dynamics of attention or make foreground or explicate the importance of interoception in a mindfulness practice. The body is pretty much left out and pay like he, he talks about paying attention to the present moment. No, no, mindfulness means paying attention to how you're paying attention, paying attention to the framing. So the, the, I'm really worried that we have reduced all of this to one practice and then we've removed the body. Jeez, we love doing this, right? We've removed the body 
from the meditative practice. And we call that, and then now mindfulness is becoming myth mindfulness, where the function of it is not transformative, but it's to make you sort of willing to accept whatever mistreatment the corporate world is inflicting upon you. That's its job and its function. And I think one of the things religion should do for us is help us to deeply sati, remember, recover, reappropriate, reactivate, revigor- re- reinvigorate that full thing you just described, that whole progression. So that would also be one of the functions of religion for today. Be- there is a definite, there is something in Western culture that drives the drives us into a deep forgetfulness. And of course, that's Heidegger, right? But drives us into a deep forgetfulness. Religion has to be a deep remembering of everything that you said. And we and we have tried to do that in the, in the workshops. And the impact on people is like, re- they, they, they are, like, it's really, it's, we've done three now and we're going to do another one in October. It's, it's powerful. It's profound. So I, I've been, I'm just, I'm just taking what you said and, and that refinessing, maybe we could make a new word, right? Um, <laughs> uh, 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 of all of that. I think that's something the religion that we're talking about needs to make central, needs to make central. So we're, we're actually recovering quite a few important functions for religion. We've been very critical in some ways, and, we've, and then we've been talking about it responding to nihilism, um, helping us to grieve the death of God. But now we're t- c- coming in at, yeah, but what does it, what, what does it, after that, let's call it therapeutic work, what does it do? What, 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 what are some of its functions? And I think, uh, so to me, this is what the logos of this conversation is doing. It's sort of like, here's the important, here's an important function. Here's an important function. Here's an important function. Here's an important function. Yeah, and uh, the functions have gravitated around language and embodiment. Yes, yes. It's interesting to think about a declining civilization of interoception that is simultaneously coupled to a very powerful production of interceptive training in small group contexts. Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. Almost yes. like the 1% economically. We may yeah. end up with a lot of people in collapsing capacity and some people with really um, spiking capacity in this regard. Yes. I was in a meta game podcast with Daniel yesterday and we talked about somatic interoception as one of the key underlying like proto skills for generating an ecology of practices and also helping to validate an ecology of practices. Yeah. yeah. I think there is this, I mean, I resonate with Bohm's deathbed warning very much. You see people trying to do group practice, maybe even in like corporate settings and things like that. And they don't seem to get to the experience of it because they lack the internal preparation, a life of practice. But then that life of practice also fails if it's um, purely symbolic, conceptual, mental mindfulness and doesn't generate these uh, sensory, motor, and physiological capacities that underlie our cognitive ability to make new patterning shapes and learn more about the affect and the structure of the world. I'm thinking of, I mean, Wilhelm Reich had this idea it was about the, the orgone, but the idea was if you don't feel in your body, it's unlikely that you're going to put it in your map. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so there's something about the, uh, not just the flows, the flows of articulated gestural embodiment, yes, setting yes. it up for being able to recognize more complex cognitive flows that give us a richer mapping of the world. And I see this tied into the history of religion a little bit. John, you were talking about the kind of Christianity that you were in. And it made me think of sort of developmental level models, right? On the personal level, maybe some of that's appropriate for what we would call concrete operational people who are starting to learn how to do facts by treating symbols as facts. But it's also tied into the, the scriptural age when most everything was arranged in like verbal assent based membership clubs yeah. um, in, in honor of the great symbols. And so that's, that's normal for a certain period of media, a certain period of society, let's say, but there are ways to do that better and worse. And I don't want to paint any general religious group with a single brush, 
but we see something in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic culture, which is a bit like a withdrawal from of the embodied dimensions of life. You get very abstract, the unspeakable name, and we can't do the depiction, and it's all about the symbols, and it's all about the, the scriptural text. And in other versions of what we would call mythic membership religion that we see in Vedanta or Mesoamerica or High Egypt or something like that, we, we see a lot more affective richness. And I wonder how much that's tied to a certain small set of practices, the way they use language, the way they use yoga or some other physical training to open the bodies up, psychedelic compounds of various kinds, but a general technology of affective expansion through the body that allows us to become more capable. And that cultures that had that may have had mythic membership religion that was much richer and more comprehensive than the one that sort of narrowed itself down in European history. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that lands well with me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think about in some traditions, there's almost a turning in, there's the, the narrowing to the text, but then there's a turning into the text to find the way back into the body. I can think about some Kabbalistic practices and things like that, that dive through the text and through the letters back into the experience of the body, uh, maybe recognizing that paucity that's there or or maybe never having lost it, but just founding another channel in. Um, but I agree generally, there's, there, you know, some of the anemic forms of, of religion that I encountered in my youth were very distressing. <laughs> you know, I really, I, in, my, in my teenage years, I had this kind of mystical experience after some tragedies, and I sought nurturance in the existing institutions around me and couldn't find it, um, couldn't find anything that actually could recognize any of the forms of experience that were bringing me to religion in the first place. Jonathan Sachs, I don't think he has any relation to Oliver Sachs. Jonathan Sachs, uh, I believe he just passed away in the Great Partnership, talks about uh, when the Greeks flipped uh, reading order. Uh, so reading was, you know, in, in, in like in, in, you know, Phoenician and, and Canaanite and Hebrew, it's right to left. And then initially the Greeks were doing this, they were doing this, which is really, and then they standardized it this way, left to right. And then the Romans picked that up and that, that goes in, right? And he makes the interesting point and it's, uh, uh, and he, he, you know, and he explicitly makes use of McGilchrist's work that when you're uh, reading left to right, you're looking ahead into the right visual field. So you tend to isolate processing in the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere, of course, narrow focus, fine detail, sequence, order, clarity, no ambiguity, no multiple meanings, et cetera, right? Because it's dealing with well-defined problems and the right hemisphere, which deals with messity, with messiness, ill-definedness, complexity, novelty, emergence is background the master and his emissary right blah, blah blah we know all this argument but but the, the point that um the right i'm tracing it back to literacy uh right and the fact that it is so ingrained in us stroop effect again by the way right i can put up letters and i and say to you don't read this word and you'll read it no matter what i don't even have to say anything you'll read it right uh, that that's uh, and you know because literacy is so empowering but the underside of literacy is the way it, uh, our literacy, just because, and think about how that can happen, eh? How just little things within a psychotechnology, can, right? Because we read, read uh, uh, left to right, we're, we're prioritizing the, uh, the left hemisphere and backgrounding the right. And then that can explain a lot of the preponderance of the features we're pointing to in what Bruce has called anemic religion. Um, and that's why, and I mean, and, and you know, uh, scripture over sacrament was, you know, one of the clarion calls of the Protestant Reformation. And, and that is such, you know, uh, uh, like, let's, let's try to make religion a well-defined problem for which we have formulas of response. And the fact that that seems so natural to people uh, and then if you say well would you do that in your 
other important relationships? Like, would you try to do that with your friendship or your relationship with your romantic partner? And they go, no, that would be insane. And then it's like, well, you, you think you can do that with reality and ultimate reality and God? Like, and, 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 and sometimes I'll actually do that sort of Socratic move on people. And I can, I can tell that it just sort of like does not compute, right? It just sort of rumbles around in there. Um, sometimes it opens people up. Other times it's like, no, you know, what, what you see, I'm not, I'm not trying to draw a direct comparison, but what you see so many people doing in the Platonic dialogue, they basically get away from me, Socrates, right, kind of thing. So I, I think um, I think it's plausible that, and this goes right back to your psychedelic experience. We haven't paid attention to the underside of at least our literate language and the way it is affecting an important kind of tyranny of the propositional and even of all of the associated cognitive functions that are sort of left hemispheric uh, dominant. Um, yeah. And again, um, I wonder about how deeply that cultural cognitive grammar of Protestantism, I mean, because, I mean, you know, Weber, Heidegger, blah, 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 right? It's been, right, woven into this, into our sociocultural framing, and how, whether or not the way our religions are now within that framing have the capacity to recover the, the non-propositional sati and to liberate us from the tyranny of the propositional. Because of that, I mean, it's because of the, 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 the pronounced and widely permeating effects of literacy numeracy, calculation, computation, uh, conclusion, clarity, and, ha and for, you know, at least hundreds of years, Christianity, well, probably thousands, but especially since the Protestant Reformation, Christianity has been interwoven with those, and the Counter-Reformation within Catholicism. Eastern Orthodoxy is a different thing, and that's why Jonathan Pajot, I think, is so provocative to so many people. Um, I just wonder, I just wonder if the legacy religions are up to it. And this returns a scan back to the theme of this series, which is maybe there's something about that God that has to die and that will be grievous to us because we are so enmeshed with it. It will hurt, but it's really important to reinventio these much needed religious functions. That's such a powerful concluding statement. It's like hard to say anything. Else. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that came up for me this past week in doing some research for some writing that Lehman and I are doing on our book, uh, I came across two Jewish thinkers who are talking about something they call speech thinking. And the notice, the, the noticing that they have that we are, they have a, a like a quadrant system of forms of speech and that we're locked into the propositional and we're starting at the wrong place yeah. of the wheel. And they say that we need to start with the imperative and then um, yeah. move through a different cycle. And because we've lost that, we've lost sense. This is Bohm's insight too, is because we've, we, we work with the, the, the products of thought and the ordering and the moving around of the products of thought in a particular way in a noun based um, objects possessed of properties way, we lose sight of the whole process that's delivered us this order in, in the beginning. So I, I'm finding some consonants between those things uh, where our starting point is off. And, and so much of what we've just said is maybe explaining part of the reason why we're lopsided in certain directions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I feel like uh, I mean, one of the things I feel like I want us to talk about more is is the world and ecology and disruption that we're facing. Yes, but I yeah. think an interesting way to talk about that, which is also a way to talk about the the death and grieving of God in a certain way, is the grieving of the propositional order of the world. Yes, yes, yes. Not to say we're getting rid of it, but we're grieving its privileged position being yes. shifted. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. 
I think one of the interesting places that we often don't touch on much is uh, in systems that have become propositionally dominant, there are quasi-religious subcultures that hold open space, like yes. within monotheism, very often occultists and magicians were yes. speaking to the dark underside of language and, yes. and representing what isn't said in our sayings. Uh, so I'd like to weave that in a little bit. Yes. Uh, yes. I feel like this is appropriate for the, the world age, for the media and technology age that we're in. And when we start to see, you know, in that time period of Nietzsche and Heidegger and these people starting, that's the birth of the electronic civilization. And it yeah. immediately starts to see its thinkers see a problem with the propositional dominance. Yeah. Uh, and that, for me, that weaves into <laughs> short points. I'm doing a course on that. I don't know when this video is going to come out, but non-duality in the network age for parallax. If people looked up parallax non-duality course, they'd probably find it. But it's going to try to look into Excellent. You know, what does spiritual and religious practice look like under the conditions of mm, digital networks, social networks, neural networks, mycelial webs, it, when that's the basic patterning of the world for us now, what does that do to our religious and spiritual expression? And not just the way we talk about it, but the way we approach it in an embodied way. And uh, now that I've plugged my own course, I also want to say that John and Jonathan Pajot and a couple other people are going to be here in Thunder Bay in the middle of September. I don't know if there are seats for that still available, but there are. anybody that comes to that, I'll be around for a conversation or a coffee or whatever anyone needs. <laughs> yeah, that, thank you for plugging that. Uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan will be there, Jonathan Pajot, Paul Vanderclay, I'll be there. There's uh, uh, Richard, oh, I, can't remember. I never remember Richard's last name. I haven't met him before. I, no, I don't think I've even spoken with him, maybe briefly on a video. He's also there from Lakehead. Um, so there'll be the four of us. Um, but uh, this is the first time that uh, Jonathan, Paul, and I will be together in person. And I've already experienced, Layman, we just experienced it at Respond. Coming together in person just takes things up a notch beyond what you can accomplish in virtuality. Um, that was one of the powerful things that came out of Respond. So I, I, I think it's a safe prediction that something's going to really catch fire when the three of us are, are physically present uh, together. So I strongly uh, recommend people, if they're interested in what's happening in this corner of the internet, and, uh, um, and I include you two in that, this corner of the internet, I think you properly belong there. Um, there's, uh, then you've got, to, you've got to come to Thunder Bay. It, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. I want to I want to pick up on one other thing, and this is also with Respond. And Lehman already uh, alluded to it from the cognitive, experiential, affective side about how we're into these simplified environments of super salience and at the expense of complexity and depth that are very orthogonal, if not oppositional, to the kind of complexity of the ecological world. And of course, we know that we shouldn't be opening up a further gap because that propositional tyranny is already killing the planet. And, and now we're exacerbating it even more. Um, and I, I, I just want to put it that to turn it, like not to turn it around, but to get us to look from the other pole. I think the religion uh, that we're trying to portend and perhaps help give birth to has to take X risk factors as central, right? That the primary domicide that we're facing, remember how the Hellenistic philosophies were born during Hellenistic domicide and the Axial religions after the domicide of the, uh, the Bronze Age collapse. We're facing a, a, a domicide um, that is comprehensive um, of, a, of an ontological order greater than those other two, um, which were already pretty um, pretty overwhelming for people. And so I think we have to take all this functionality that we're talking about, and it has to be, in order to be properly practiced, it has to be practiced for its own sake. Because if you try to make it instrumental, you're, you're doing the very thing to it that it is trying to get out of. So we're in a weird paradox. We have to do all those things for their own sake and 
we have to do it for the sake of saving the world. And part of what the what religion needs to do is how do we properly live that sort of paradoxical thing I said, where we have to do these practices for their own sake, or they won't take on life. But nevertheless, we have to be doing them for the sake of saving the planet. Uh, and how do we get that so that we can live into that paradox properly and appropriately? I put it to you that that's a bit of a meta task that we're facing. Intrinsically rewarding practices that have the side effect of saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to have a side effect orientation, right? You don't want to, I don't pay attention to the fact that the world, I'll just do my practice. Like that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the trying not to try. We're, we're, we're saving the world without trying to save the world, but by not trying to save the world, we're actually appropriately saving the world. And we can say sort of pseudo Zen things like that. Um, but I think that's something that, well, I'm sort of wrestling with it. How did, because that's what one of the things that came out is coming out for me from uh, the respond retreat that Layman and I and a bunch of other people attended, which is how do, how do we do that? If we make all of these things instrumental for saving the planet, in one sense, that's absolutely what we have to do, but we will actually kill them because they can't be pursued or practiced instrumentally. But if we do that while ignoring the most important domicile we're facing, the religion will fail in a more fundamental sense. So we're trying to avoid two kinds of failures. We're trying to avoid the crippling failure of instrumentalism, but we're trying to avoid the failure of not, right, not responding to the domicide that is threatening us right now. That's really resonant. And earlier when we were just picking up that theme of grieving the death of God, yes. actually one of the things that I was thinking about that time was grieving the state of the world and yes. grieving yes. the overall collapse uh, of, of so many different systems and our impact on so many different things and, and the, the domicile that you're talking about. So I think that's a nice circle to complete because we, we, we focused in on, especially the death of God and possibly as layman's yeah. just bringing in now, thinking about the death of our idolatry of the propositional, but rounding that back out to really reflect more deeply on how we participate in and respond to the broader global living situation. Um, I think that's really beautiful and vital. Um, and I guess since everybody's plugging courses, I want to say something too, just <laughs> put it out on the internet. <laughs> I really wish I'd been able to go to the respond retreat. That would have been lovely. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm at work in my work. I'm about to lose my job in a couple months. And so I'm going to have a lot more time for <laughs> retreats while I'm looking for a, a new way of being. But in November, no, actually, it's going to be in October. They moved it in October. I don't know if I've mentioned to you, but I'm giving a keynote speech at Stanford University. Excellent. Post metaphysical spirituality and leading three days of workshops on Kumya Yoga, kind of embodied practice. Um, so that'll be one thing I'm doing with them. And then putting together a course on post metaphysical spirituality for the Integral Life Organization. And then also hopefully developing a course on a kind of a yoga of the senses and relating it to some of the stuff that we've been talking about uh, regarding the, the reosoma and the holoflux and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I agree with what you say that I'm, there's great potential for, for, for some sparks if, if we can all get together and practice in the same place. I think I will be at the WTF conference in Sedona with, uh, with Lehman as well in, in November. Uh, what's the WTF? Uh, they didn't know, I think, that it stood for something. <laughs> for them, it means, uh, what's the future? Um, uh, it's an okay. integral spirituality conference. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going both to, probably both to London and then to Chicago in November, so I, I don't think I'll be able to do that. Gentlemen, I need to go, but it seems like we've come into, we've done a, a two sort of circles, and I, I feel like what we've done today is, is very complete. And I want to, yeah. I want to thank both of you. I, I, this was really helpful for me. And, and like, even that last point, I said it was, it, it, this conversation helped me crystallize that in some important way. Uh, so I want to thank 
I want to thank both of you. Very rich, very rewarding. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you again.